All right, fantastic. So, a bit of a cryptic title, but um, hopefully it'll become clear in a moment. My name's Kevin Flager. I'm Head of Molecular Endocrinology and Pharmacology here at the Perkins. Um, some of the work I'll be talking about today involves a, a company on the stock market called Dimeric, so that's just the standard forward-looking statements. Um, so what I'm going to do is get straight into some, some, uh, some science. So how do hormones work? So the first thing is that hormones flow around in the bloodstream and they bind to receptors. Receptors are molecules on the surface of cells and they bind this hormone that comes through the blood and they're activated. And when they're activated, they change the conformation of the molecule and the inside, inside the cell, the conformational change is actually causing a signaling cascade. So you can get lots of molecules coming together, binding each other, being turned on, and uh, starting processes within the cell. And it's important to understand where those molecules are and the timing of those interactions and how they're being switched on. So one of the technologies I'll talk about today, we can actually label these molecules, and using that technology, we can actually see how close they are in real time in live cells. And by monitoring that, we can see which things are being turned on, in which order, and how that's all working. So this is the connection to jellyfish. Okay? This is uh, some pictures from University of California in Santa Barbara. Um, you'll see these documentaries from David Attenborough. It's wonderful. Um, blue bioluminescence from jellyfish and sea pansies. And you can see here as well, around the outside, there's this green fluorescence. And if you zoom in, this is actually what it looks like. This is a green fluorescent protein. So this is sitting in these jellyfish and these sea pansies. And how that uh, is glowing green is because you've got a luciferase enzyme in the, in the jellyfish. That's giving off some blue light when it metabolizes its substrate. And if it's got a green fluorescent protein right next to it, really, really close to it. There's some energy that can transfer, and you get less blue light given off and some green light given off. Now, that energy transfer occurs through a process called resonance. So if you think about tuning forks, two tuning forks close to each other, and you get resonance between them, same principle, but at the molecular level. So you can actually get resonance energy transfer between one molecule to the other, which means the second molecule starts fluorescing. Now, where does that apply to what we do in the laboratory? Well, we can actually take the DNA for the luciferase, and we can actually engineer that onto the end of the receptor we're interested in. So this could be a receptor for the angiotensin receptor, which controls blood pressure, for example. We put the luciferase on the end of that, and that sits in the cell, and that glows blue when we add our substrate. But if we put our green fluorescent protein on the end of another protein we're interested in, if we then add a hormone and the receptor changes and these molecules all come together to signal, as they come together, they bring together the luciferase really close to that green fluorescent protein. So we get energy transfer occurring, less blue light given off, more green or, or yellow light given off, and that we can detect that and know that these are things are happening. So this is a way of detecting in live cells in real time, remembering at really, really small scale, that we've got these protein-protein interactions happening. We can do this by looking at some instruments. And how many of you have been up on a lab tour? Did you see the, the fluorescence room? So these are the kinds of instruments that are in the fluorescence room. And they can measure light through something called a, a photomultiplier tube, the detector. That detects the light emission coming off the, the, the wells that have the cells in. And we filter that, just like you would in a, if you're doing photography, we have a colored filter on your camera. We have filters that filter blue light or yellow light. And we can actually detect, we move that filter around, and we can detect the blue light and the yellow light. And the ratio between the amount of blue light coming off versus the amount of yellow light coming off tells us how much interaction we have between these proteins. Now, we took that one step further. We actually came up with a, a technology approach, and we patented this. So we, this was patented several years ago now. 
And it's a configuration of this experimental procedure. So we take one receptor that's sitting in our membrane, we attach a reporter system component to that, so like the luciferase, but then instead of attaching the green fluorescent protein to the other receptor that we're interested in, we actually attach it to this interacting group. Okay, so this is one of these interacting molecules that's looking to, to signal in the cell, and we attach the, the green fluorescent protein to the end of that. What that means is that when the hormone binds, or the drug binds, binds this receptor, if that's nothing to do with the, the rest of the proteins, if it's nowhere near them, then nothing will happen. You won't see anything. But if these are really close together, when that hormone binds, this interacting group comes up and interacts, brings up this reporter component, and now these are really, really close together. And that gives you a signal. And this proximity needs to be about five nanometers, which is really, really small. Um, these, these, sorts of, these are probably about 10 nanometers across. So if it's five nanometers apart in order to get a signal, these have to be really, really close together. So that tells us that a complex has formed, that these receptors are somehow interacting, and that you're getting some um, functional interaction between them. And so what one of these receptors is doing is affecting the other receptor. So this is the most complicated slide. I'm a pharmacologist, so this is a bit of pharmacology. So if you get lost on this, don't worry. I'll, I'll bring you back to the big picture. But See if you can follow along with this. We're actually interested in, in particular with two receptors. One's the chemokine receptor, chemokine receptor two, and that's important for inflammation, and inflammation is bad. There's also another receptor called the angiotensin receptor, AT1, and that's important for controlling blood pressure. Okay, so this is called a concentration response curve. And as you increase the amount of chemokine you're adding to the cells, and this is sort of like the hormone, um, as you add more and more of that, you get a signal. And you get more signal as you add more chemokine. Okay, so that goes up, and that's telling us the chemokine receptor is being turned on. Now, in this system, we don't have any angiotensin receptor there. So if you add lots of angiotensin on top of a, a high um, concentration of the chemokine, you just get the same response, okay? You get a maximal response of the chemokine signal. And there's no change when you add more and more angiotensin too. The interesting thing's over here, because if you have the angiotensin receptor there, so you've got a chemokine receptor, you've got an angiotensin receptor, you've got the same response from the chemokine system, that's switched on, and, and get, the signal gets stronger as you put in more chemokine. The interesting one is if you've got a high a, a large amount of the chemokine, and then you add more and more angiotensin, you're actually inhibiting, you're actually turning off that chemokine signal. Okay? So the angiotensin system, which is normally associated with blood pressure control, is somehow turning off the chemokine system, which is important for inflammation. Now, why is that important? Well, a lot of people are on medication to control their blood pressure. Having high blood pressure is bad. So the angiotensin receptor blockers are a frontline treatment for reducing blood pressure, which is an important thing to do. And it's important if you've got kidney disease, because kidney disease, if you've got high blood pressure, you're forcing um, things through a filter, just like you're forcing through things through a, a, a hole in a hose if you increase the pressure. So you want to reduce blood pressure if you've got um, issues with your kidney. But... If you've got a situation where, by, by blocking the blood, by reducing the blood pressure, you're also, you're also exacerbating inflammation, that's not a good thing. So this hypothesis that came out of the discovery here is that you also want to reduce the chemokine signal. So as well as block, lowering the blood pressure, you also want to low, lower the inflammatory response. So that brings us through to kidney disease. So kidney disease... This is our kidney, it's very, very important. We have blood flowing through here, and then we have, this is called the glomolus, and then we have urine. And this is a filter. So it's very important that we filter out all the, the things we don't want in the blood, and that comes out. But what we don't want filtering out is, your, is uh, protein. So the protein should be staying in the blood. And if protein leaks out, that means that we've got a problem with our kidney, 
and that we're actually getting leakage of protein. So if protein's in the urine or proteinuria, that's, that's a sign that there's, there's a problem with the kidney. So what we've done is we've, through this principle that, yes, you want to reduce the blood pressure, which is herbisartin. So that's good for lowering the blood pressure, and it's approved in the US for diabetic kidney disease to lower the blood pressure. You also, on top of that, you want to add this chemokine antagonist, so that's something that reduces the chemokine inflammatory response. And in fact, this particular um, molecule is approved in Japan for hepatitis. And hepatitis is a condition that affects the, the liver. So this hasn't been used for kidney disease before, but through our studies, we've realized that it can actually be very useful for the treatment of kidney disease. So what's the proposed mechanism? Well, the herbisartin is currently used for this. It's, it's used to reduce the blood pressure, so to reduce hypertension. And that reduction in hypertension, reduction in blood pressure, reduces what we call hyperfiltration, which is too much going through the filter. Okay? So that's what the herbisartin does. On top of that, the chemokine blocker reduces the inflammatory response. Okay, so it's that combination that's absolutely critical. And something, that el something else that we, we found from our studies was that the cell where this happens in the, in the kidney, which is called the podocyte, because it looks like a foot, um, the podocyte where the action is, that um, contains these different receptors, and by adding both of these drugs together, it seems to protect these podocytes. These podocytes seem to die off or apoptose, um, in kidney disease, but by taking this combination, that seems to happen less. So this seems to be protective. So these are some of the results. So we've already run some clinical trials in patients. Um, these are the, the phase 2A results from 2017. So just to step back a, a minute, um, a study was done in 2001, not by us, by somebody else or another group, and they found in a large group of type 2 diabetics that herbisartin um, reduced the amount of protein in the urine by 24%. Okay, so you took herbisartin, the amount of protein in the urine was reduced by 24%. What our study showed in 2017 from, from Dimerix, which, and I was uh, um, Chief Scientific Officer of Dimerix, and I'm now Chief Scientific Advisor and, and one of the um, inventors of the technology that came out of the Perkins. Um, what Dimerix's study showed was that if you add on top this chemokine blocker, you reduce the amount of protein in the urine by a further 35.6%. So 24% from the herbisartin, an additional 35.6% from the DMX200. So that was a fantastic result, um, and actually it worked um, most effectively in, in the diabetics. And why is that extra reduction important? Well, it's important because there's evidence that a reduction of protein in the urine by more than 30% on top of the current um, herbicidin treatment could well increase the time to dialysis by three to five years. And that's very important um, because dialysis, um, this is a progressive disease. Uh, as people's kidneys fail, they need to go on to dialysis and then they'll need a transplant. So if we can delay that, um, that's a fantastic outcome. So there's two types of chronic kidney disease that we're looking at at the moment. Uh, a condition called focal segmental gomosclerosis, I'll call it FSGS. It's a serious and rare kidney disease. It's considered rare, but there's actually 120,000 individuals in the US with the condition, um, and more than 95,000 patients are on the kidney transplant waiting list as a result. So that's, that's one area we're looking at. Um, the other one is a much bigger group of people. There's 23 million people diagnosed with diabetes. Uh, incidence of that is growing, um, and 10% of diabetics develop kidney disease. So if we can actually use this approach to treat diabetic kidney disease as well, uh, that will be a very important outcome. So we're currently running um, clinical trials. In fact, they've just finished um, recruiting. And we're running, um, this is a double-blind um, clinical trial, which means that the people running the clinical trial don't know who's getting the drug and who's getting the placebo. It's randomized, so as people come in, they don't know who's going to get the drug first or who, who um, is going to get the placebo first. Placebo controlled means that some of, the, some of the patients get drug and some of them get placebo, so it, it, but they don't know which is which. Um, and then it's crossover. So that means every, 
uh, half the people get drug, half the people get placebo, then there's a six-week washout, and then they cross over. And then the people that got placebo first get the drug, people that got um, drug first get, get placebo. So that means every patient gets the drug, and they become their own control. So it's a, it's a very good um, study design. Um, so we're running 10 patients through FSGS, so five controls, five um, with the drug. 40 for diabetic kidney disease, 20 with placebo, 20 with the drug. They're starting off with 300 mg daily of herbisartin for at least three months. So that's what they're currently being treated with. They, they keep treat, being treated with that. They don't have to stop. They just keep going. And then on top of that, they're adding the DMX200. Um, we're trying to understand whether... Firstly, we've got good evidence already that it's safe, but we want to double-check that. And then is it actually reducing the protein in the urine and improving kidney function? Okay, so with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Um, can, I, can I just clarify, this is um, an added on medication that people aren't on an uh, anti-inflammatory or a medication for an inflammatory, other inflammatory process and their medication... Uh, Yes, so that's right. It's an adjunct therapy. Yeah. So they're on their current medication, which is herbisartin. Yeah, and for, they the blood carry, for blood pressure. For the blood pressure, and they yeah. carry on with that. And in fact, if they've got chronic kidney disease, people with chronic kidney disease often do have high blood pressure yeah. because there's a relationship. Yeah. So they keep on that herbisartin, yeah. and then we add on the chemokine blocker. Okay, so that chemokine blocker isn't something that they would be on for another purpose, quite apart from that, no. Only if, they, only if they happen to be in Japan and they've got hepatitis B, but not in not Australia, no. It's not, uh, it's not approved for any use, uh, therapeutic use in Australia. In fact, some of the patients from that 2017 trial are still continuing on the drug uh, using a special access um, program which the doctor can um, apply for if you've been on a trial and it seems to be working. Yeah. The um, resonance reaction you talked about, Yes. Uh, you said they had to be very close together, but yes. is there also an orientation that the molecules have to be to, to do that? Absolutely. So um, it's called, called Forster resonance. Um, it is, they do have to be orientated appropriately. So generally what we do is try and allow some flexibility so at least some of the time they're aligned. If you constrain them, you could get lucky and get really good energy transfer, but you could actually constrain them in a way where they're not giving you any. So we try and give them some flexibility so that at least some of the time they're aligned. Um, the distance dependence is inversely proportional to distance to the sixth power. So they have to be very, very close and correctly orientated. Yep. Okay, well, thank you very much indeed. Happy to...